are all part of the universe. When we think we are individuals, we separate, separate ourselves and it becomes a prison when we lose the fact that we are part of the universe. That my hilltop experience was when the first time I went to the United Nations, and that was the first year it was opened in the UN. And um, we, I, I was living in Chicago, or in Illinois at the time, and we flew in, of course, it didn't take long. And the first thing we did after we checked into our hotel, which just as a block, was to run down to the United Nations. And by that time, there was about 65 or 70 flags flying outside. And I thought when I put my foot on the ground there that that's the first time in the history of the world, the first time that the world has said that everybody has a right to health and uh, a decent life and, and education and so on and so forth, that we have really written it down. If we wanted to go to Rome, we would prefer to travel with a pilot who had been there before. Yet when it comes to life, most of us fly blind. In earlier times, teaching and guidance was in the hands of the elders. Now we have no time to ask questions. It's a funny thing, because a youngster is pushing toward being a grown-up, you know, and getting to that stage where they can, they can say, I don't have to listen to you anymore. You know, and thinking that they reached a level where they understand and they know it all and you know nothing, you know. And even going so far as to have that, that thinking in their heads, well, you're old and you don't, <laughs> you don't understand. That's one of their favorite statements, but you don't understand. Not remembering that that older person at one time was at their level. If you could come back, who... If, would you want to be someone different, or would you just want to be the same as you are? I think probably the same. Um, I've had a lot of, well, I've had a lot of tragedy in my life, as you know, Serena. But uh, Serena's my great-granddaughter, by the way. I'd just as soon be me, because the truth is that I like who I have become. And you, you don't hear many people say that, and I couldn't have said it a few years ago. But gradually, over the years, I've made myself into the person I am. And I like what I've become, I really do. I did a, uh, a film about ITT, a one-hour documentary about international telephone telegraph. And the incidence of heart attacks, uh, a lot of these guys were very unhappy people. A lot of them were drinking. The very head man, I used to see him up on Cape Cod all by himself down by the ocean, sitting and brooding. Don't tell me this was a happy, cheerful Zen student enjoying nature. Uh, once up in a time, my doctor told me, you know, the way you are, that's why you don't have ulcers. With all the problems you have, because you speak up, you throw it out. Maybe I will have an ulcer someday, but up to now I don't have one. And I have a lot of problems. <laughs> but, I, but I don't keep them for me. I throw them out. Sometimes I'm, I am by myself someplace, you know, way over there on Ladera Lane or Vista Road, way over there in the mountains, and I just stay there and, and I yell and scream when there's nobody around. And it's good for you, I think. Well, it's been for me, it's been good for me so far. When my wife left me, I realized that what I thought would was success was not success. Mm -hmm. It was just a small part of it. It was success, but it was a very small part of it. I didn't know what else it was, but I knew there was something else. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was distraught. And someone suggested that I meditate to quiet my mind. And I think I told him, if I could find a building tall enough, I think I'd jump out the window. I can't believe I could stop my mind and meditate. So he said, 
try it. Next time you wake up in the morning, which is usually every morning around two o'clock in a cold sweat with so many problems going on, my brother's dying and lawsuits and a lot of things that were contingent. And after two or three mornings, I was able to go back to bed and sleep for another four or five hours and wake up refreshed. And that started me meditating. This was about 35 years ago. Everything that is brought forth has an opposing force that makes it not quite so easy. If good was all there was, why well, everybody would be flying around like angels on the planet. But I don't know whether we even learn much or not. And I think the purpose here is to get wisdom. And that's done, as I see it, through coming up against things. Today, life is so complex, so filled with busyness, we think we're going to live forever and have effectively removed ourselves from any overall perspective. I've read a lot of these books about near-death experiences, and uh, most of them are very positive. That was the feeling I had, uh, that uh, just leaving this particular form, that life itself goes on. One man I knew who was very worried about this was Gunnar Myrdal, the great Swedish economist. He was here one time and I took him home from a conference and we were talking and he said, here I have filled my brain with all this wisdom and knowledge and I've studied and I've written many books and when I die it's all going to crumble into dust. And I said, Gunnar, how do you know it will crumble into dust? How do you know that that it won't go on in some way, that you won't go on in some way. And he sighed and he said, I wish I had your faith. You're so fortunate to have a religious faith, but I never could have the faith. And I said, well, it's a gift. And I don't know why some people have that gift and some don't. I've known a lot of people who wanted it, including many famous people I've met, but they didn't have it. Not to leave out the most important ingredient in that feeling is a connection with God, which people don't particularly like to hear too much in this day and time, unless you're in a certain setting, you know. But um, without that connecting that's there, without you becoming aware of that connecting, you're, you're, you're kind of lost, you know. <laughs> and I really think, to be honest, you're lost altogether. When, when I die, I think that as a human being, I will not exist, but perhaps some of the good I have done or some of the things I have said will live after me. I don't believe in an afterlife, I said. I don't say there isn't, because I, I like to play both sides. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, I think this, and, and that's, that's all right with me, that uh, I don't think I have to have another place to go to or anything like that. But, uh, and it doesn't bother me particularly. It doesn't bother me. Do you believe in life after death? Of course. Do you? Mm -hmm. Good. I don't think it matters whether you do, you'll find out. Sure, we can't look up at the stars and wonder, are we the only inhabited planet in the sky, in the firmament, in the cosmos? Of course not, how could we be? It's a very, it would be a very, it's a very arrogant supposition on our part, it seems to me, to even consider that we might be, because we're not, we can't be. I don't think God necessarily resembles what Michelangelo painted on the Sistine Chapel, uh, nor do I think necessarily he's a he, uh, nor do I think there is necessarily a particular being as such. Uh, so even Voltaire said, um, the presence of a watch indicates a watchmaker, the presence of the world indicates a god. That's, that's pretty cute, but God, that's, that's pretty misty and hazy to me. I really would rather concentrate on people to people, and people joining whatever 
mystic cosmic force there is. Rather than brooding about how many angels are on the head of the pin or whether the Methodists got a better line on it than the Muslims, who cares? If I do something that is pleasing or I feel good about, I think it's translated that God is operating to whatever extent I can express it. And there's no one that's all God, or, but there's some who have come like the Buddha and Jesus, and now there are many Christs in embodiment who are making a difference on the planet. We may not, you know, sweep all of mankind, but neither did Buddha or Jesus for their time. We say to people, I don't like the way you pronounce the name of God, so I'm going to kill you. It's as simple as that, and that's what we do do. We're doing it now. We're doing it all over the world. We've always done it. We're certainly doing it in, in, in the Middle East, and we're, we're doing it everywhere. Don't like the way you pronounce the name of God. I pronounce it this way, and this is the way it should be pronounced. If you don't pronounce it my way, you're wrong, and I'll kill you. There is a creative force. It's so sacred that I think that we can't even really talk about it. I think it's uh, beyond our ability to have an image about it. We can recognize that force. We can recognize that holiness and that uh, beautifulness the beauty, um, we can experience that love, um, but to really put it into words, to try, try to define it uh, either visually or verbally is, uh, I think, maybe impossible because it goes beyond that. As soon as we start to put a name to that force, we, we put some kind of a limit on it. And it's, it's beyond, it's beyond that. And that is everywhere. That is in the least thing and the greatest thing. If we human beings develop the ability to listen to each other, we might see some real compassion come to life. So when I see my wife, my memory goes back too many places where we experienced the last 35 years. And her role is played out in the care facility. When my role to go to see her is twofold. First, to, she, she doesn't recognize me per se, but she smiles when she sees me because she is a recognized person. And I go to see her because, on another level, because I'm a human being. And I need her. It is like a harvest to me. And we are possibly harvesting some of the things we didn't intend to. I don't think any of us ever intends to be old and sort of helpless, but at the same time, I'm harvesting friendship, I'm harvesting love, I'm harvesting caring as I never dreamed of. I don't know, there's only one message you want to give to the world, and that is love, L-O-V-E, is the message. It's the answer to every question. Every question comes down to love at the end. If you follow it down through logical steps down to the beginning of the question, you'll find that it comes out that way. And I remember on the plane coming home, I thought, I've had a vision. Earth can be fair if we all learn to work together. It can be. And I, I really have never quite lost that. When you look at a child, I mean, look how clear and, 
and wonderful they look. When I look into a new baby's eyes, a new, what you, you know, especially when they're first born, the infants, there's everything there. The whole, all of the knowledge and wisdom is there. Hopefully they begin to get wise again towards the end, but not necessarily. <laughs> I tip my hat to the old generation. You bore us, you took us this far. Time's running out for the old generation. Allow me to send you my heart. You had days of jubilation, frustration and hope. Stop and watch your generation, you never let go. Through the years of the depression, you carried us through. Now in times of great progression, I'm thinking of you. Boca, Astero, Sir Chaplin Caruso, I thank you for letting me see. The dreamers, the thinkers, the winners and losers, we are who you made us to be. You knew the world with no aviation Radio was just a toy for the young After a war you had peace on probation Then Hitler came in and you had to be strong I tip my hat to the old generation Your life brought a light to the cave Time's running out for the old generation I hope we'll deserve what 